Good morning. God be with you, precious, loved children of God. And because we are precious and loved, then no matter what's happening in our life, we can say, it is well with my soul. Let's pray. Great God, thank you that you are in this space. Lord, help me to not get in your way. Help everyone to hear the message that you want them to hear. Thank you, God. Amen. Okay. All right. When I spoke in March, I invited everyone to have the mindset of Christ, uh, being God's servant and helping others to know about God's love and belonging. And I encouraged everyone to get out of their comfort zone and try and meet new people, get to know new people in the church. My hope is that you're doing that and, and hopefully it's going well. <laughs> we're human, we're fallible, it may or may not be going well. Uh, last week, I encouraged everyone to recognize that we are all one in Christ, that we can experience unity in the midst of our diversity. And today, we are celebrating communion. And that means we have a special focus on Christ's sacrifice for us. He took the death that we deserve so that we could have the life that he deserves. And he did this because we are precious and honoured and loved by him. Did you know that you are precious in God's eyes? That you are honoured in his eyes, that he loves you? My belief is that the more that we truly know how precious we are to God, how honoured and loved we are by him, the more that impacts who we are and we are able to love others. I think it compels us to love others when we know that we are loved. <coughs> okay, we're going to look at a Bible passage today. Um, and you heard the scripture reading, that's the passage we're looking at. There have been many songs written about that particular passage. One of them I used to sing uh, with my child when he was young. When we first moved from Australia to Canada, we were in student housing just on the hilltop down here. And it was pretty good. You come in the front door and there was half a dozen steps up to the top floor and there was half a dozen steps down to the basement. And the basement had really big windows so it was really quite light and bright. And that was good because we'd never seen a basement before. Um, we don't have basements where I come from. Uh, and so, you know, that was okay. But two years later, when my precious little baby was five years old, some of you know Sean, um, we bought a house in Lacombe. And it was two levels as well, but it was different. Uh, you came in the front door and then went around over here, and there was the stairwell to get down to the basement. So it was, you know, twice as long as the stairs and probably then some. And the windows down in the basement were little, so there wasn't a lot of light coming in. And the people who had owned the house before us had put blue carpet on the stairs going down to the basement and on the walls and on the ceiling. We called it the tunnel of love. Um, but my little five-year-old Sean was scared to go downstairs because it was dark down there and he didn't like going down. And so in my endeavor to help him overcome fear, I would stand at the top of the stairs with him and we would, fear not, for I am with you, fear not, for I am with you, fear not, for I am with you, says the Lord. And we'd sing it a few times and we'd start running and when he was ready, he'd run down the stairs and flick on the light switch and then he was good. <laughs> light is a good thing. Okay, so our passage Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 5, do not be afraid, some translations say fear not, for I am with you, says the Lord. This is a good thing, but our whole passage, this is in a passage, and 
I want us to look at the whole passage today. I was studying it recently and discovered something that I thought was really exciting, so I want to share it. It's really sad for everyone else who doesn't get that chance. You discover exciting things and you might want to share them, but you don't have this position. So <laughs> I'm lucky. Okay, we'll read through it again. Now, anyone? Okay, we're back. Okay. But now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have redeemed you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your stead, since you are precious and honoured in my sight. And because I love you, I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. For everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. So before we jump into the passage, I want us to take a moment just to understand a particular literary device. It's called a chiasm. My understanding is that it was found prevalently in Greek literature and the structure that it makes looks like the letter chi in Greek. Um, and so a chiasm is designed to let the reader know the exact point that the author wants you to take home, the one that's really important. And so in the passage, the first thing, point in the passage has a parallel, a mirror, in the final point in the passage. And the second point in the passage has a parallel with the second last point, and the third, the third last point, and so it goes on until we get to the middle point, and that's the focus. That's the really important piece that he wants you to take. And when I was studying this passage, I found a chiasm. Who knows if it's real or not, but it is for me, so I'm running with it. Okay, so in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1 tells us that God created us and formed us, and verse 7 finishes with God created us and formed us. The next thing in verse 1 tells us that God summons us by name. We are his. And verse 7, the second last thing in the verse, tells us that we get, talks about those who are called by his name. So both verses have us belonging to God. He knows our name and we are called by his name. So what have we learned so far? We are created and formed by God, and we belong to God in intimate relationship. It's a good start. Verse 2 says, I will be with you. And verse 5 says, I am with you. So both of these passages are highlighting that God is with us. Verses 2 and 3 go on to describe the ways that God will be with us when troubles come our way. No matter how bad it is, whether it's fire, flood, whatever it is, he, is, he will be with us. And verses 5 and 6 talk about how God is with us no matter where in the world we are. He will go to the ends of the earth to gather us up, to call us, to bring us home, to be with him. So can you see the parallels that are going on here? each time as we come. So what is the focal point? What does verse 4 tell us? You are precious and honoured in my sight, and I love you. That's the piece he wants us to take home. I think that's wonderful. Okay, so the focal point is we are precious and honoured in the eyes of God, and he loves us. Okay, so... God created us and formed us. He calls us by name and he acknowledges intimacy with us, that we belong to him and he gives us his name. He is with us no matter what is happening or where we are in the world. And he does all of this because we are precious and honoured in his sight and he loves us. But that isn't everything in this passage. There's two more significant words that I want to have a look at. So the first... <clears throat> 
Verse 1, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. Use that one? Okay. And someone will turn this off for me. Okay. Thank you. All right, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. The Hebrew word for redeemed is goel, and that's talking about our kinsman redeemer, our closest of kin, who is able to act on our behalf. So if we find ourselves in a bad situation where we're in financial debt and we have to sell everything that we own uh, to be able to pay off the debt, then our kinsman redeemer can come along and he can buy everything back for us and give it to us as the original owners. And that's really lovely. Our kinsman redeemer has that right. But if our debt is so big that even selling everything off won't qualify, uh, then back in the day, you could sell yourself into servitude to be able to cover the debt. And your kinsman redeemer is someone who could come along and buy you back out of servitude. The kinsman redeemer has the ability to go into court on our behalf to make sure that justice is done. And the kinsman redeemer also has the ability to make justice happen. It's a pretty cool role. And this verse is telling us that God is our kinsman redeemer, our closest of kin. He has redeemed us. His life, death, and resurrection enable him to restore the earth to us, to set us free from sin and death and self, and to bring justice, establishing his kingdom on the earth. And our kinsman redeemer does all of this because we are precious and honored in his sight, and he loves us. The other word that's really significant for me is in verse 3. And you can see I've highlighted it, the word ransom. God is saying that Israel is so precious to him, so honored to him that he's willing to pay whatever price is necessary to ransom Israel, to bring them back. Paul tells us that the price that Christ paid for our ransom was his life. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. So God the Son sacrificed himself as a ransom for us. Whether we know him or not, whether we love him or not, he died so that we could be ransomed. We could be redeemed from the enemy who kidnapped us. And Jesus himself, when he was here on earth, he described his coming death as a ransom. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus put his stuff, being God, on hold while he came down here to be one with us and to redeem us by being our ransom. He did this because we are precious and honored in his sight and he loves us. And the more we experience his amazing love, the more we are compelled by his love to be like him to put our stuff on hold and make ourselves available to serve others. It's Easter this weekend, and we celebrate that Jesus is our Redeemer, our closest of kin, our kinsman Redeemer, who redeemed us from slavery to sin and self by being our ransom wearing the cost of the consequence of my sin, which is death, so that we could have his life. He conquered death by being raised to life. So this weekend, in a very special way, we focus on the fact that he has conquered sin and death. He has ransomed us and redeemed us and set us free because we are precious and honored in his sight and he loves us. Throughout the rest of this service, I would invite you to really contemplate 
on God's radical, extravagant love for us, the radical lengths to which he was willing to go so that we could have life. He humbled himself. Are we willing to humble ourselves and obey his command that he gave us at the Last Supper, recorded in John chapter 13? Jesus knelt and washed the disciples' feet, and he tells us to wash each other's feet. It's a little role play, it's an object lesson that enables us to more concretely experience what it is to be a servant, to humble ourselves, to remember that the creator who made us and formed us gave up heaven and came down here. And washing the feet is also like a little mini baptism. It's a reminder that we are sinful beings and we need someone else to wash us clean. It's not something we can do by ourselves. So in a moment, we are going to move downstairs to wash each other's feet, just as Jesus did at the Last Supper. After we have washed each other's feet, we will come back up here into this space and we will complete the other stuff that Jesus did at the Last Supper that he invited us to do in remembrance of him. Now, just remember the rooms downstairs are slightly different from what they have been in the past. You can take your bulletin, they're listed in the bulletin, and my understanding is there's also signs on the doors downstairs. And we have rooms for ladies only, men only, for couples and for families. So wherever you want to fit, we've got it covered. Uh, while people are going downstairs to wash their feet, we're going to have a children's story up here for the kids that don't want to go downstairs. Um, and then after that, we're going to have a time of singing praises so that as you come back into the sanctuary, you can walk in just singing praises to the Lord. And as you return, you'll be receiving at the entryways the little cup of grape juice and the wafer to be able to participate in the rest of the service. So I would invite you now, oops, to relocate for foot washing. God bless you. <laughs>